Okay, our next speaker is Robert Foss, who's going to talk about running Android on the mainline stack. Uh, hi, uh, so I'm Robert Foss, and uh, uh, I'm not named after open source software. My mom's also named Foss. She does not do software in any way, uh, <laughs> unfortunately for me. Uh, I work for Calabra, and uh, we're totally hiring in case you're uh, looking for something open source related to do. Uh, just come talk to me or look at the website. Uh, and if you want to get a hold of me, uh, I'm on Twitter, so, you know, just shoot me a tweet. Um, uh, let's get into it. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, running Android on the mainline uh, graphics stack, which sounds maybe easier than it actually is. It's a little bit complicated, but uh, let's get into it. Uh, so we're going to talk about the Android history with respect to open source and also um, how it's actually done, how you run Android on the mainline graphic stack, uh, and what the current status is, as well as maybe the, the bigger picture, uh, what's happening, where uh, Android is going, where open source is going with respect to Android. Um, yeah, so if we start with the history, uh, this is sort of what it looks like. Uh, this is the number of lines uh, of diff against the, the Linux mainline uh, kernel. So this is for Qualcomm. They're just, you know, a vendor. There's a bunch of them. But chances are that you're using a, a Qualcomm SOC now. Most of us are. So uh, uh, most of these vendors have a diff of around um, one million lines at the very least. And as you can see, Qualcomm is between like uh, 1.5 and like 3.5 million lines. And, uh, there's maybe a slight like downward trend, maybe. It's too early to tell. I guess we'll see when we have the sources for uh, uh, 4.14 of the kernel. Uh, anyway, it's kind of interesting uh, to visualize what's going on. Uh, so this all sort of started, or our, this talk is starting where uh, Android forked the Linux kernel. And uh, uh, that was yeah, in the 310 days. And uh, they did it for. Uh, yeah, for good and bad reasons, I guess. Uh, but they really needed a, a better graphics stack. Um, so the current one uh, that was in the kernel, the a ABI, was just not good enough. It didn't suit their use cases. So uh, there wasn't enough support for the low power use case, which obviously is important on uh, a cell phone. You don't want to burn through your battery in an hour. Uh, and uh, also, uh, they didn't support uh, uh, atomic operations, and uh, atomic operations are uh, uh, when you uh, uh, change some settings, uh, for example, let's say you change the resolution of your monitor and maybe the bit depth at the same time. You want to change both, and with atomic operations, you can sort of do both at once, and either both will fail or, or both will succeed, but it prevents you from ending up in a really weird, like, unknown state where some things have been applied, maybe some haven't. Um, so uh, uh, atomic operations was defi definitely needed for, for their use case. Um, and as far as uh, the low power use case uh, goes, uh, there wasn't much support for like exotic hardware, like dealing with the low power display uh, use case. So uh, uh, display uh, managing hardware of different kinds uh, had pretty poor support. Uh, so they really needed something better. Uh, so they introduced uh, the Android Atomic uh, Display Framework, or ADF, as you'll see it called. Uh, no one really explains what it is. <laughs> it's just ADF. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the ADF was written by uh, an Android kernel engineer, uh, Greg Hackman. And uh, it was sort of written from scratch. So it wasn't built on top of um, the current or then current uh, um, graphics APIs provided by the kernel. So he just did his own thing, uh, which made it possible for him to get this working quickly. Uh, but it, it also uh, ended up being a little bit problematic. Uh, so uh, ADF ended up being not terribly extensible or generic. So it suited their use case of mobile hardware uh, uh, well and did everything they needed. But for the generic maybe desktop use case, it wasn't enough. Uh, it also didn't really support like, all kinds of different hardware. Uh, so there was, it was kind of limited in how it was designed. Uh, for example, it didn't support 
uh, atomic operations for, for all parts of the um, subsystem. So uh, in the kernel, there's a bunch of different like logical components, like um, uh, there's the connectors, which are you know connectors, like the DRM port, or the, the, the VGA ports, or the HDMI ports, or the display port ports. Uh, there's also planes. Planes are like buffers with some properties attached to them. So it's basically what you see, like here's a plane of pixels. Uh, and there are like uh, CRTCs, which are CRT controllers. There, it's maybe perhaps a bit, a bit of a misnomer nowadays. Uh, CRT uh, monitors aren't really around, but CRT uh, or monitor controllers still are. And in the kernel, they're referred to as the CRTCs. So anyway, all of these components have properties, and uh, they need to be changed in an atomic way in order to reduce or to avoid flickering and uh, avoid getting into an inconsistent state. Uh, so that's why you want atomic uh, uh, operations. But just having them for, for planes is not really good enough. Like, sure, it solves some problems, but it doesn't solve all of the problems. Uh, also, oops. Uh, also, it wasn't built on top of the current uh, KMS ABI, uh, which was problematic because that meant that every driver that existed for Linux didn't support this. Like, none of it did. Uh, so what happened was that all of the proprietary vendors it went away and uh, uh, got busy coding, and they all implemented ADF. So, uh, for example, uh, yeah, let's just go with uh, ARM and Mali. Like, they have an ADF driver. Everyone has an ADF driver if you're shipping uh, a cell phone. And uh, that's entirely separate from, from what's being implemented for uh, the open source mainline uh, kernel, which is unfortunate. Uh, so uh, this wasn't really upstreamable. While it was an improvement in some ways, it was not really good enough for being accepted upstream. Uh, so instead, uh, a bunch of people, uh, Daniel Vetter uh, specifically, uh, worked a lot on, on implementing the uh, KMS Atomic ABI, which is um, pretty much the, uh, the same ID, but uh, a bit more generic. So it's the Atomic ABI. Uh, built on top of the, the previous KMS drivers. So there's a pretty smooth like upgrade path. Uh, you have your KMS drivers that you've always had for like the, the Intel drivers or whatever. And then you start adding support for the atomic features. And uh, you don't have to throw all of your driver away, which is pretty nice, because it turns out writing a driver takes a lot of effort and time and money. So people aren't too keen on doing it. Uh, and it supports all of the ADF use cases, and uh, it does it uh, in a more like generic way. And it's being generic through adding uh, properties to these different uh, uh, modules, like the planes and the CRTCs and the, uh, the connectors. So there, there are these properties. They're basically key value mappings. Like you'll have a string, uh, go with like name, and then you attach a value to it. And that's basically it. It's very simple. So you can inject whatever property you want, and a user space can read out these properties and understand what's going on with the hardware. Uh, and uh, now, like now, as in currently, it is displacing uh, ADF uh, from the vendor drivers. It's still very much like a work in progress. And their drivers are still very much not open source for the most part. I'm still talking about uh, uh, the mobile vendors here, which they're notoriously not so great at this, I would say. <laughs> um, but internally, they're switching from using ADF to, uh, to using uh, Atomic KMS, which is very nice because it's a step towards open source. Uh, it's not perhaps very tangible yet, but it's a step in the right direction. Um, so um, let's have a look at what the Android graphics stack actually looks like. Um, it's a bunch of stuff, uh, on top of which we have uh, the apps. And this is the stuff you actually care about. Like, like really, this is what it's all about. Um, and below these apps, and there's like a bunch of apps. There's not just apps that you think of as apps, but there are done a bunch of different applications doing uh, but, yeah, stuff like running the, the status bar, for example, updating your clock. Um, below that, we have Surface Flinger. And Surface Flinger sort of takes all of these uh, uh, surfaces that uh, apps draw. So let's, <laughs> let's speak about uh, 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 the parlance here. Uh, so there are surfaces, there are planes, 
and there are layers. And these are all the same thing. Uh, so for, various, for, for some reason, every vendor has shows in their own word. And uh, now we have a bit of a confusing word salad going on. But uh, surfaces are planes, are layers. Um, so Surface Flinger basically deals with all of the planes and layers uh, and surfaces that um, applications draw to, and then combine them into something, do something useful with it, uh, and then sends it uh, onwards. So uh, for example, if we look at this uh, uh, Android desktop, uh, it's just an ordinary Android desktop in portrait mode, no, landscape mode. Uh, and on top here, got the status bar. And uh, as you can see, it's like mostly transparent. It's pretty skinny. It doesn't require like a full buffer, like a full resolution, like uh, uh, 1920 by 1080 or whatever uh, resolution buffer to, to represent it. Um, and then there's the, the navigation bar which also is pretty small, like it doesn't require a full buffer to represent it. Uh, and they sort of overlap here, and uh, as, as you can see, there's no problem there. And then there's the background, which is rendered, obviously, furthest, furthermost, furthest most in the back, and it does require a full buffer. And in order to handle this and like render it properly, uh, you, you have to pay attention to well, where your surfaces are, are supposed to go, and they have to be organized somehow. And that's basically what Surface Flinger does. So it takes all this, this mess of surfaces that uh, applications create and then uh, gives it to the hardware. And, and that's basically what it does. So it takes um, the surfaces, uh, communicates them over a protocol called uh, HWC, the Hardware Composer um, API. Um, and talks to the hardware composer. Um, so what's the hardware composer? <laughs> uh, it uh, just receives layers from, uh, from Surface Flinger uh, through the HWC uh, API. And then it optimizes them. Uh, we'll get into that. Uh, and then it outputs it to the display hardware. And that's basically it. Uh, it's, it sounds very straightforward. You take the layers and then give them to the hardware. Uh, but it gets kind of messy uh, in that hardware is not like ideal. It's it's not ideal hardware. So if you have a uh, a piece of silicon that supports um, uh, outputting stuff to your display, it probably doesn't support infinite amounts of layers because that would require actually having infinite amounts of uh, memory, which hardware vendors are are very much not into. So there's sort of a sweet spot around four layers. That's what uh, Android rep. Uh, Google and Android uh, uh, tells the hardware vendors to implement. Uh, it's not too much memory, but it'll cover most use cases. And uh, in return, Android will try to not have more surfaces than four because it gets messy. Um, so what happens when you have uh, more than four uh, uh, surfaces? If we look at the, or think about the, uh, the background image or the, uh, the Android desktop image we were looking at, we listed three surfaces but the icons weren't listed, so that's another one. And what if you get like an error message or something? Something pops up, that's five. That's more than the hardware can support. And this is where we get into optimizing layers for display. So now you have more uh, layers than you actually can output, uh, and you'll have to do something about it. So you'll have to smash some of the layers together um, so that you'll actually reach the, the magic number of four or less. Um, and the way you do that is sort of important. Um, you can choose which layers to combine intelligently. So maybe you'll choose to uh, combine uh, the, very, the smallest layers you can find. And just combine them and do as little work as possible outside of the uh, display hardware. And uh, just uh, uh, output the remaining uh, combined layers to the, the hardware. Uh, so this sounds really messy, and it sort of is. Uh, it's definitely complexity, and uh, there's a good reason for it. Uh, so, oh, <laughs> there is a good reason for it. Uh, and the reason is power savings. So the display hardware is far, far more efficient at, at uh, doing this hardware composing work than your CPU is, and also than your, than your GPU is. And furthermore, it's not just about power efficiency, but uh, removing work from the GPU and moving it to the hardware, uh, display hardware uh, means that your GPU can do more work. So you'll be actually faster, which is nice. We all want that, power efficiency and speed. 
have your cake and eat it too. Um, so if we look into this, the little box that implements all this junk, it's the, um, it's the driver, it's the user space part of the driver, and it implements the hardware composer, and it also implements all the, the good stuff that you're used to, like uh, OpenGL or, or Vulkan, and it implements memory allocators, all kinds of, uh, of little parts. Um, and below it, of course, we have uh, the, the kernel. Uh, has to be somewhere. Uh, so part of the driver also most likely lives in the kernel, or definitely lives in the kernel, uh, but we'll get, uh, we'll get into that. Uh, so uh, so uh, now that we have, like, now that we got like an atomic KMS, the atomic KMS um, API for talking to, uh, to the graphics subsystem of the kernel, we're full of the happy, fuzzy feelings. And uh, what Google actually did uh, was to ship a device using KMS. So they uh, took their own framework, Android Atomic uh, uh, Display Framework, and just threw it out and uh, built uh, the Google Pixel C, which is an interesting device because it uses uh, the uh, KMS ABI, um, but it also runs a, a closed source NVIDIA driver because there's no sufficiently good uh, uh, open source uh, NVIDIA driver for their part. So uh, uh, they actually needed something to implement this uh, HWC part uh, or HWC uh, uh, API because there, there's nothing in the uh, open source stack that implements it. Like Mesa doesn't implement it. The kernel does definitely not implement it. So something has to implement it. And uh, uh, what they came up with, or rather Sean Paul at Google came up with, uh, was DRM Hardware Composer. And it's, an, it's a hardware composer built on top of the uh, uh, normal, uh, everyday Linux desktop stack. Um, and let's have a look at that. So uh, this is the same stack we were looking at before, but the open source stack is, is a little bit different. Uh, so if we want to replace this uh, proprietary blob with, with something, we'll have to figure out what something actually is. Uh, it has to implement HWC2, which is the API currently used. Uh, and it does that using DRM Hardware Composer. But there's also more to it. Um, we need more parts. The, the driver uh, does have a few moving parts in it. Uh, and the, the biggest parts are um, it's Mesa. Uh, Mesa implements uh, OpenGL and uh, APIs like that. Uh, and there's also uh, DRM, D that's the kernel uh, DRM subsystem. Um, so that's where your kernel drivers live for your graphics card. Um, and in order to talk to DRM uh, or the DRM subsystem in a convenient fashion, uh, there's libdrm. And it sort of abstracts away some of the pain of talking to the kernel. When you interface with the kernel, you'll talk ioctals, and ioctals are no fun to program. Uh, and uh, uh, so libdrm abstracts away uh, a bunch of that and just gives you nice functions, nice fu functions that give you the, the warm, warm, fuzzy feelings. And it also abstracts away some, some other boilerplate-y stuff, which you're not particularly interested in. Um, but there's, then there's more. There's even more. Uh, then there's Graloc. Um, it's sort of, uh, it's, it's one of the, uh, I don't know, sort of pain points in, in the stack. Uh, there's currently... As far as I know, at least uh, four open source implementations of Graloc, and they all basically do the same thing, but they're slightly different. So uh, um, there's the DRM Graloc, for example. Uh, that's the old open source uh, implementation. There's GBM Graloc, which is the new cool one that we all use and love. And then there's what uh, Chromium OS ships, which is uh, mini GBM, which is probably even nicer. Um, and then on top of that, Intel has their own like fork of mini GBM called just Intel mini GBM, I guess, uh, which is uh, a support for even more features. And they need features to enable their hardware, so that's very understandable. But now we have four, four implementations of basically the same functionality, so it's, it's a slight mess. Uh, and uh, we're working on that. We're going to see if we can shrink it down to one again. We'll see. Uh, so, yeah, anyway, that's what the entire stack looks like. I've omitted basically nothing. This is what it looks like. Um, so if, 
Uh, now that you have an idea of what uh, DRM Harvard Composer does and where it lives, let's talk about some, some recent developments, I guess. Uh, sometime, um, I'm not sure when it was introduced in, in Android, but uh, a, a bunch of years ago, Android introduced a feature called uh, Fences or Buffer Fences. And it's a very nice feature. It allows you to have a buffer and then sort of associate uh, uh, events to it. So you can wait on the buffer to become available, which means that you can do stuff like uh, uh, just communicate buffers between processes uh, in a secure and reasonable manner. You can get, you'll always get the expected results. And you can also synchronize buffers, uh, which means that you can have a part, like for example, the, uh, the webcam, it creates a buffer, like it takes a picture, creates a buffer, and attaches uh, like a fence to it. And uh, with that fence, uh, it can then send the buffer before it's even done writing it out to the GPU. And the GPU can go, OK, this fence isn't ready yet. Uh, ping me when it's ready. And when it's actually ready and the, all of the pixels have been written out to the buffer, the GPU will be poked. And then it can use the buffer immediately for, uh, like, as a texture and do GPU stuff with it. Uh, so it allows distinct pieces of hardware or processes to communicate in a, in a nice way. And it, uh, it really reduces uh, complexity. Uh, for uh, HWC, uh, or for hardware, the hardware composers, previously you needed a bunch of threads to do, like, uh, to, like pull buffers, have a look at them, and then some, um, some mutexes and semaphores, and it was like a, a, a slight nightmare. Uh, but with fences, it's a lot simplified. You can just wait for the fence, and do when it's done, it's done. And uh, the user space impl implementations sort of just shrink, and the complexity really shrinks. So it's, it's very nice in that respect. And uh, Mainline received support for fences uh, in 2016, thanks to uh, Gustavo over there. Uh, and uh, uh, as a part of developing um, uh, support for fences, uh, DRM Hardware Composer also received support for, for Francis and uh, Hardware Composer 2. Um, so it's sort of a, um, a chicken and the egg problem, where if you want to upstream a feature to the kernel, you have to implement it somewhere. You can't just upstream untested code. It has to be implemented somewhere. So DRM Hardware Composer was chosen because it's a relatively small impl implementation of, uh, of a, a client to these uh, ABIs. Um, so uh, DRM Hardware Composer implemented support for Fences and HWC2, uh, and then the kernel got uh, explicit fencing uh, implemented or upstreamed. Uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, the current status for uh, um, DRM Hardware Composer is that we uh, were just moved. Like a few months ago, Google uh, allowed us to, to move from uh, Chromium OS. Like the project was created as a part of uh, the Chromium OS project. A lot of good, interesting stuff comes from there. Uh, but it was also hosted within that project, which made it kind of hard to contribute. Uh, and as an open source project, you kind of want to lower the barriers of entry to zero. Uh, and we moved to freedesktop.org, where most of the, uh, un uh, the Linux desktop uh, graphics projects actually live, like Mesa, for example, libdrm. All this good stuff uh, lives at fd.o. Uh, and I'd like to just thank Google for it. Uh, they didn't have to do that. And uh, it's certainly inconvenient for them. Uh, now they have an external dependency instead of a, an internal. And it just makes their workflow uh, more cumbersome. So it, it wasn't nothing for them to do. So I appreciate it. Uh, Sean Paul, who created DRM Harbor Composer, pushed for this. Uh, Pune Kumar and uh, Marissa Wall also helped out. So thanks, guys. It's very much appreciated. Uh, and furthermore, um, uh, we're creating a, a GitLab instance for really for all um, FD.O projects. But hopefully, a DRM hardware composer will be one of the first ones uh, to, uh, to move and also further lower the bar of, of contributing. Just have an interface. That's what people are, are used to seeing, I guess. Uh, make it simple, as simple as possible. Uh, we'll see exactly how, how it turns out, if we, we'll keep mailing list development or not, but uh, we'll, we probably will. We'll see how it goes. Anyway, so uh, we've covered what it is, and 
and why and how we got here. Let's have a look at where we are. And there's a, a few platforms that have been tested, and, and I said, I say tested, but uh, that we brought up. Uh, there's the IMX6, uh, which is a very common embedded platform. It uh, uses the, the Vivante GPUs, the 3000 series, or some of them use the 3000 series. Uh, and uh, last, last year, like for most of last year, uh, we were working on, on bringing this up. Um, and thanks to the, uh, the, uh, the Vivante uh, Etnaviv uh, graphics driver, this is finally possible. Uh, like a, a lot of really good work has gone into reverse engineering the Vivante uh, uh, GPU, and it's like in a really good shape now, like uh, more so than, than most other graphics drivers, actually. So that's very nice. Um, Lucas Stack, Kristen Jeminer, Vladimir van der Laan were amongst those that helped out doing this, or actually made it happen. And I, I just used their work, so I'm very thankful. <laughs> uh, there's also the uh, uh, Dragon Board 410C. It's based on the uh, uh, Qualcomm 410 uh, SoC. So it's an old uh, cell phone SoC that they sort of made into um, an embedded system because I guess that was the, the simplest way of doing it. Uh, and it runs an Adreno GPU. Uh, so Adreno GPUs also have a rather good driver support in the Freedreno project. And the Freedreno project was uh, uh, created by uh, Rob Clark, and he's sort of been pushing that, far, uh, that uh, ahead at l like an alarming rate. He's incredibly productive. Uh, and uh, uh, so bringing uh, uh, the, the uh, Android graphic stack up on this device wasn't too hard. Uh, the, the, the GPU support was already there. Uh, and that brings us to what's being worked on currently. It's the HiKey 960. It runs the, I think it's the High Silicon 960 SoC, which has uh, an ARM uh, GPU. And uh, there isn't really a, a, a viable open source driver for the, uh, the, well, basically any ARM GPU but specifically not uh, for the G71, which is their latest architecture. That it's called Bifrost. And uh, there, there's a, there is a project for creating a driver, uh, but it's still in the very early days. I, I really hope to see it uh, uh, push ahead, because it would be nice to have a, uh, a truly open source graphic stack running on this. But for now, we're, we're stuck with proprietary drivers. Uh, and currently, uh, Linaro is working at bringing uh, um, Android up on this device. Um, Jan Stoltz is doing a lot of really good work. Um, and uh, it shouldn't be too long before this one is in the, the verified uh, 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 column. So uh, hopefully that'll work out. Yeah. Uh, so uh, that brings us to the last part, the big picture, what's actually going on here. And there's, uh, there are some conclusions we can draw. Uh, so new features seem to get introduced into Android, and some of the features are like, like really good, like uh, solid improvements from the current status quo. Uh, and those features eventually get moved uh, into the kernel. Um, so that, that's true for the fences we looked at, and that's also true for uh, the um, atomic display framework. Like it was not moved, but uh, re-engineered. Like it's, it was a good idea, so we did it again properly. Uh, and now the kernel is way better because of it. So when you think of Android, uh, it's obviously l like a mixed bag. There's lots of closed source stuff in there, but it does push us forward. Like if, if nothing else through uh, uh, just doing their own thing, that maybe is actually better. Uh, but this isn't necessarily true for all parts of the kernel. Uh, if we look at the diff again, Here's the, the Qualcomm versus mainline diff for version 4.9. And uh, there's lots of stuff, like mostly drivers that uh, never really will be moved into mainline. And that's for various reasons. Like there's maybe a lack of incentive on Qualcomm's part, or maybe the driver is only available for this one SOC one time. So if they take the time to upstream it, it'll be sort of uh, not so useful going down the line. Um, but uh, if you look at this graph, uh, about two-thirds uh, are drivers, and there's some other stuff in there, too. Uh, much of it's uh, multimedia-related, so 
graphics or, or uh, video. Uh, not all, though. Um, yeah. And the diff seems to be like fairly constant. Like if we go back to the, the graph we had a look at initially, uh, it's not a clear trend here. Like uh, if we look at at the 318 bump here, that's uh, the the diff from 314 to 318 is mostly drivers again. Like drivers get added, drivers get removed. There seems to be a lot of churn for their uh, SOCs, uh, which is an interesting data point, but. Uh, maybe it isn't the most optimistic or, or it doesn't cause a lot of optimism at that point. Like, there's churn. It'll probably never be fully, like, mainlined, this stuff. Uh, but it's interesting nonetheless to, in terms of painting a, a bigger picture. Um, and also, uh, we've seen um, that open sourcing graphics drivers has been uh, really, like, uh, pushing the development speed forward in terms of like uh, you creating a new device and you already have 95% of, of the hardware supported and maybe you have some quirks but if you just can get started and see something like render on the screen that, that's a pretty good place to start you can fix what whatever's remaining and uh, it it isn't too much work whereas if you have uh, a proprietary driver and it doesn't work like that's that's unfortunate. That's, uh, there's not much to do about it uh, except for like calling the vendor and hoping that you're like big enough fish for, for them to care, uh, which may or may not be the case. Um, it also uh, lowers development costs for vendors. We've been seeing this recently with uh, with Qualcomm and the Adreno drivers. Uh, they're actually contributing to the free Adreno driver because it is good enough that it is valuable to them. So they're pushing support for their latest or upcoming GPUs into the Freedrino driver so that it can be used, uh, which sort of means something. Um, and uh, it's also interesting. Um, also, we've been seeing like, a, a nice bumping in, uh, in driver quality. Uh, it's, and if something is broken, it's easily fixed. So that's in, uh, very much in our interest. Uh, and, uh, and lastly, all of this sort of sums up to pushing open source forward. Uh, and at least in my mind, I see like compelling evidence for features being moved from the proprietary domain into the open source domain, and then even being main, uh, mainlined, which is what we all want. Like that, that's what gives us the, the warm and fuzzies. Uh, yeah, uh, that's, that's it for me. Uh, if you have any questions, just go ahead and ask. Any questions from the audience? So do you think the reason that um, some vendors are beginning to pick up and uh, use the existing stacks is because there's a lot less for them to develop? I think uh, the reason is that they're seeing demand. Like people use this stuff and they want it to work well like out of the box, there's, there's value there to them. So that's why they would be inclined to, to contribute, I think. So if you create something that's valuable enough, they will be interested and they will contribute if, if they have the resources. If you look at a vendor like uh, Vivante, they're like pretty tiny, like it's a very small company. Maybe they don't actually have the resources to push for something open source themselves. But uh, on the other hand, we're pretty far uh, along in, t in terms of support for that platform, so that's good. Hi, uh, you mentioned that uh, hardware composure uh, also does some squashing uh, for the layers, right? Sorry? Uh, you, men you mentioned that the hardware composer uh, squashes layers. Um, yeah. And does the DRM hardware composer do that also? Yeah, that, uh, but maybe poorly. Uh, okay. So um, uh, when you have too many layers, uh, DRM hardware composer will uh, fire up the GPU and uh, through OpenGL, smash some of the layers together. Uh, it won't be particularly clever about this. It'll just grab some layers. But maybe what you really want to do is grab the smallest layers, because you're doing expensive computation, and you might want to minimize it if you can do it more effect efficiently somewhere else. Um, yeah. Hi. Uh, 
what's the status of uh, Vulkan support and where does it in, where does it stand in the stack you've shown? Uh, so Vulkan support, as for the status, I'm the wrong guy to ask, but it's implemented in, in Mesa and uh, also uh, in the kernel drivers, but you, Mesa would be what you would be talking to. So Mesa implements lots of these APIs. It's basically like a, a sort of a catch-all project for many of these uh, things. Any more questions? No? Okay. Thanks very much.